It's day 104 of the war in Gaza. It's also the first birthday of one-year-old baby Kfir Bibas, the youngest hostage still in Hamas captivity, having spent a third of his life as a hostage. The IDF says its military intelligence and military pressure are being employed to locate and free the 136 people remaining hostage. And LTV Steve Leibovich has more. The war is raging in southern Gaza, where the IDF killed more than 30 terrorists in the Hamas stronghold of Khan Yunus over the past 24 hours. The forces have expanded operations westward, pressing the assault against Hamas leadership believed to be hiding in and under the southern Gaza city. <laughs> היא הרחיבה התקפה, את ההתקפה שלה לגדוד נוסף שנמצא, גדוד חמאס נוסף, שנמצא בדרום חאן יונס, וכעת היא מבצעת התקפה שם. ביממה האחרונה היו שם קרבות קשים. לצערי, היו גם נפגעים. כוחותינו חיסלו רק ביממה האחרונה יותר מ-30 מחבלים במרחב. At the same time, the IDF spokesman Hagari said that military intelligence is trying to locate some of the 136 hostages remaining in Hamas captivity, including in Khan Yunus. He says the efforts to return the hostages are a top priority for the IDF, which includes intelligence and operational actions. Hagari said the efforts to return the hostages are now a top priority for the IDF, which include intelligence and operational actions. Most important, said the Army spokesman, is to press the ground offensive to create ideal conditions on the ground so that there will be more moves to return the hostages. Meanwhile, the IDF said troops operating in central Gaza found and destroyed the rocket launchers used to fire dozens of rockets this week at the southern city of Nitivot, the largest barrage in weeks. Troops found three launchers, each capable of firing 10 rockets at a time. The barrage was fired from a location in the central part of the Strip from which IDF troops had recently withdrawn, but was not declared by the IDF as under operational control. Meanwhile, in a humanitarian gesture, the government announced that new field hospitals will open to replace Gaza hospitals that were used for terrorist operations and were badly damaged in the fighting. They deny the kidnapping of our children, the murder of our grandchildren, the rape of our daughters. The new Nazis we face today will stop at nothing to destroy civilization as we know it. The World Jewish Congress was created exactly for these times like this, so every Jew can fall asleep at night knowing they are safe in their own home. We are a voice for the Jewish people everywhere. We are the World Jewish Congress. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reportedly rejected a proposal from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken that could see Saudi Arabia normalize relations with Israel in exchange for Jerusalem agreeing to provide the Palestinians with a pathway towards statehood. And LTV's William Sharon reports. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says that Israel would not get genuine security without there being a pathway to a Palestinian state. The Biden administration has reportedly presented the plan to Prime Minister Netanyahu. The answer has not been positive. But the, the, the choice is there. And ultimately, this is about choices. Um, what kind of society do we want to live in? What kind of world do we want to live in? What kind of region do we want to live in? We talk a lot as well today about regionalization. Mm -hmm. There's a profound opportunity for regionalization in the Middle East, in the greater Middle East, that we have not had before. Blinken cautioned that the plan could only advance with the support of the Israeli government. You're talking about a governance, a government and a structure of governance that maximizes the ability of uh, the authority to actually deliver what the Palestinian people want and need. Uh, but it also has to be able to operate in uh, what you might call a permissive environment. In other words, with the support of uh, with the help of Israel, not with its um, active opposition. Because even uh, the most effective authority uh, is going to have a lot of trouble if it's got uh, the active opposition of any, any Israeli government. Prime Minister Netanyahu has reportedly rejected the U.S. plan and recently said that his actions over the years prevented the formation of such a state. And joining us now is a member of Knesset for the Likud, Dan Ilos. Dan, let's start with your new initiative, the new law speaking about 
placing sanctions of financial bodies that do pay for slay. We're in days, you know, where some voices speak about letting Palestinian workers into Israel again. Please tell us more about this law. Uh, so first of all, we know that the uh, Palestinian Authority has over the years paid the salaries uh, to the families of terrorists. This is something that has gone on for years. Uh, Israel has tried to stop this, uh, including uh, removing part of the funds uh, that are equal to those funds uh, uh, paid to those families uh, from the money that goes to the Palestinian Authority, but it hasn't worked because the Palestinian Authority has always preferred paying uh, for those uh, terrorist families uh, rather than for the goodwill, uh, for the good uh, of its people. And so right now we're trying to attack this same uh, problem uh, which incentivizes terror in the Palestinian Authority areas uh, by, uh, by, uh, uh, by stopping the financial institutions that actually uh, bring uh, this uh, money to the Palestinian Authority and then to the families uh, of those terrorists, again, thus incentivizing terror. Uh, we're trying everything we can in order to stop this, and this is one more uh, weapon in the arsenal of Israel to stop this. And when is it supposed to kick in? When is it supposed to start? Right now, it's just starting the legislative process, so there's still a few uh, steps ahead. It, it needs to go through the Knesset, pass the votes, and so we're very early on. It's hard for me to put a timetable, uh, but I'm very intent on getting this uh, passed as quickly as possible. Dan, now switching to another subject, U.S. President Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken are by now you know, fully busy with a day after the war in Gaza and are trying to limit Israel's actions in Gaza. Is U.S. pressure causing Israel to lose this war? Uh, I have to say that I, I feel that uh, instead of speaking of uh, U.S. pressure, we should speak of the U.S. support all along the, uh, the way uh, for Israel. I mean, we're uh, uh, over 100 days into this war, uh, and the U.S. still hasn't called for a ceasefire. It understands that Israel must defeat Hamas, not only for Israel's good, uh, but for the good of the free world. So yes, sometimes we have misunderstandings, sometimes we have uh, things that we don't agree on, uh, but when it comes to the actual goals of this, uh, of this war, which is the complete defeat of Hamas and the bringing back home of the hostages, Israel and America are on the same page, they're still on the same page. We'll keep arguing respectfully about things we disagree, but these are arguments between friends, uh, not arguments between uh, competitors or enemies. Yes, and you see that Israel is slowly withdrawing from Gaza, less and less forces inside, but Hamas ability still exists. I mean, I know this is a hard question, but strong on the hostages, still firing rockets, rearming. What's the plan here? No, so I want to be very clear. From the start, uh, Israel has said that this will be a very, very long war. And from the start, you can look, look three months back and see what plans were shown to the public. I'm a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, so obviously I get more details. But these were things that were also said to the public, that there will be around three months of very intensive fighting where we hope to dismantle the, the, the military capabilities of Hamas as a military uh, organized group. But afterwards, there will be up to a year uh, of guerrilla warfare, which we will still be uh, dealing with. And the tactics to uh, fight guerrilla warfare are different than the tactics to fight an organized military group. Uh, and therefore, we're using different tactics. You're right that we're not using the same tactics and the same intensity uh, as we did in the beginning, but it was always part of the plan. And so I, I hope that the public can understand this. This war is not over. It's going to be very long, but the goals of the war are still exactly the same. And even if we change tactics, it doesn't mean that we change the goals of the war. You're saying not changing the war goals. You know Israel is sur surely also busy, at least in thoughts, with the day after in the region. What are some of the plans you're hearing? The decision hasn't been made yet. It would be a lie for me to say that there is a decision. I do think that one of the things that uh, the public needs to understand is that the day after Hamas is not anywhere close. Uh, right now, just today, me together with uh, three other Likud members, we actually published a plan uh, that we hope to see, not for the day after Hamas, but for the days in between what's going on now and the day after Hamas, uh, and what Israel must do in order to ensure that Hamas uh, doesn't uh, put its head back up, uh, the, that uh, the IDF doesn't lose some of the gains that it made uh, during this intense uh, war uh, 
uh, time. Uh, and we speak of different uh, things, including keeping the north of Gaza uh, without uh, any significant civilian population, as we keep on uh, ensuring that there are no terror tunnels. We keep on ensuring that there aren't any terrorists and other things of the kind. Uh, I don't want to go into too much details, but this is something that we published today. But we are understanding that there will be a long time between the day after uh, and what's going on uh, right now. Uh, and the day after is not anywhere close. There's still a long time. We're in these discussions right now, uh, we can tell you one thing that's for sure, is that Hamas will not be in any way part of the day after. And when it comes to me and my party, we've also made it very, very clear that the, that the uh, Palestinian Authority that incentivizes terror cannot be uh, a part of the solution also. Dan, indeed, there's still a long way to go. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android and Apple. The IDF announced that the deaths of five soldiers in fighting in the Gaza Strip and one in an accident in central Israel, bringing the toll of slain troops in the start of the ground offensive to 193. The fallen heroes are Master Surgeon Reserve Zacharia Pesach Haber, 32, of the 14th Armored Brigade's 87th Battalion, from Jerusalem. Surgeon Major Reserves Yair Katz, 34, also of the 14th Armored Brigade, 87th Battalion, from Cholon. Staff Sergeant Oria Aymal Goshen, 21, of the Givati Brigade's Reconnaissance Unit, from Jerusalem. Master Sergeant Anwar Sarhan, 26, from Khorfesh, a fighter in the 910th Battalion, Etzion Regional Brigade, fell in an operational car accident in the center of Israel. On Tuesday, the IDF announced that Surgeon First Class Reserves Nitan Chesler from Khadera fell in battle in the southern Gaza Strip, and Surgeon Major Reserves Noam Ashram from Kfar Saba succumbed to his wounds sustained in battle. May their memory be blessed forever. The stories from October 7 are endless. They're all painful beyond imagination, and this time an IDF soldier's father reveals how Hamas tried to sell his son's head in Gaza after murdering him that morning. In a heart-wrenching interview with Channel 14, David Tahar, father of the late surgeon Adir Tahar, revealed the horrific ordeal he faced in bringing his son's remains home after he fell in combat on October 7. Tahar began by recounting his son's final moments, sharing the anguish of learning that 19-year-old surgeon Adir Tahar's body had been filled with trepnel from a rocket and grenades. However, the tragedy didn't end there. The beyond barbaric terrorist beheaded his son, taking the head back to Gaza. Over two and a half months, Tahar tirelessly searched for his son's missing head. He described the difficulty in identifying his son physically, resorting to a DNA test for confirmation before the burial. The turning point came when the Shin Bet, through interrogation of arrested terrorists, discovered that Hamas tried to sell Adir's head for $10,000. Special forces in a daring operation located the head in an ice cream store in Palestine Square in Gaza, next to the terrorist documents and tennis balls. Despite recovering what remained of his son's head, David Tahar shared the grim reality that it too had undergone abuse during its time in Gaza. Tahar, after facing these unimaginable atrocities, expressed the family's intention to establish a center in surgeon Adir Tahar's name to aid at risk youth in Jerusalem. Additionally, they have initiated the creation of a Torah scroll in his memory. The IDF is ready to confront Hezbollah, but Israel has reportedly given the U.S. a promise not to launch a major offensive into Lebanon. And now to be Steve Leibovich has more. Washington is trying to contain the spread of Middle East warfare, and NBC is reporting that Prime Minister Netanyahu has agreed to a request from Washington not to launch a major attack against Hezbollah in Lebanon for now. The reported agreement is in contrast to comments by IDF Chief of Staff Halevi. Visiting the Northern Front, Halevi said the likelihood of war in the North is higher than before. 
During a drill simulating an offensive in Lebanon, Halevi said the IDF have learned a lot of lessons from the fighting in Gaza. Many of them are very relevant to fighting in Lebanon. Halevi said the goal in Lebanon was very clear. The 80,000 Israelis displaced by Hezbollah rocket fire must be able to return home with security. Meanwhile, in Lebanon, the IDF struck a Lebanese Hamas terror cell minutes after it fired rockets at northern Israel. The cell fired the barrage at the border town of Roshanikra. The attack was carried out by a Hamas cell operating in southern Lebanon. The IDF also hit a number of other rocket launching sites and Hezbollah infrastructure in southern Lebanon, including one used in an attack on the Mount Dove area. The U.S. has officially redesignated Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist organization. The U.S.-led coalition also launched a fourth round of strikes on Houthi's targets in Yemen, which continues targeting commercial shipping in the Red Sea. Back to LTV, Steve Leibovich. The move to designate the Houthis as terrorists partially restores sanctions Washington lifted three years ago on the Iranian-backed group, whose repeated attacks in the Red Sea since Hamas's October 7th terror onslaught have significantly disrupted shipping in the key maritime corridor. Earlier today, the Secretary of State announced the designation of the Houthis as a specially designated global terrorist effective February 16th for threatening the security of the United States. What's changed is we have seen them launching attacks on commercial shipping uh, in the Red Sea, something that wasn't the case in 2021. In 2021, Biden removed the terrorist label, which had been applied by his predecessor, Donald Trump, during his final days in office. The terrorist designation came as the U.S. carried out a fourth round of strikes on the Iranian backed Houthis in Yemen. The U.S. fired Tomahawk missiles from missile boats, hitting some 14 Houthi missiles intended for attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. The Houthis began attacking merchant vessels in November, saying that they were responding to Israel's military operation in Gaza. Since then, the group has launched dozens of attacks on commercial tankers, passing through the Red Sea. In response, the U.S. and U.K. have launched waves of airstrikes against dozens of Houthi targets after Houthi forces ignored an ultimatum to cease their attacks in the region. Meanwhile, Iran's foreign minister said that attacks against Israel and its interests by the so-called axis of resistance that includes Hezbollah and the Houthis would stop if the war against the Hamas terror group in Gaza ends. If not warned the Iranians, the conflict could heighten tensions across the Middle East. And in a major development for Israeli travelers, the Hungarian low-cost airline Wizz Air has declared its return to the Ben Gurion airport from March 1st. The airline suspended operations at the start of the war, but is set to resume flights just ahead of Passover. Wizz Air plans three weekly flights to London, Rome, Krakow, Budapest, Bucharest and Sofia. A drop in prices to these destinations is anticipated and foresees the resurgence of more low-cost carriers, with Bluebird Airways, Tus Airways and Lot Polish Airlines also resuming services. The influx of airlines signals potential fare reductions, offering budget-friendly travel options. Shirley Pinto, former Knesset member for the National Unity Party and deaf social political activist, has since October 7 been independently dedicated to explaining the Israeli cause or Hasbara in sign language in Israel and worldwide, especially to individuals with disabilities and primarily to the deaf. Shirley, an honor hosting you here today. We also have your translator, right, Liat Peugeot, here with us. Real, real honor. You're reaching millions. My pleasure. Our pleasure too, really. It's really you're reaching millions around the world with your activities, with everything you're doing, with your work. Tell me some more about it. Yeah, actually, since October 7, as the war started and I found myself uh, dealing with a lot of talked in the, my national, sir, in my national in Instagram and Facebook, people trying to attack me. And I, I find out there is more than 10 million deaf people around the world that don't know nothing about the state of Israel, about the war, what happened in October 7. And I told them, I said, I have to, I have to work in this area. There is nobody like explaining sign language, international sign language, what happened. Every m m movie that I made came to five million people that watching. It was, it was really amazing. And I, I understand how much it's important. And people really want to know what happened on the side of the state of Israel. 
even the Jewish community around the world who is deaf, they feel completely alone because the state of Israel is not giving some explanation about what happened in, in an Axis ways. And uh, I was meeting with the minister in foreign affairs, explaining about all the problem about that the people around the world who is deaf do not know nothing about what happened. And we have to explain in an Axis way. I explain about what happened in my uh, Instagram, Facebook, and everything, and I become an official member of a uh, superstar, a real superstar. Now you've been to the U.S. lately, right? And uh, an amazing tour that garnered a lot of attention. I understand you have another tour coming up in February. What were some of the message messages you were getting from people? How were the reactions from people hearing what you have to say? Hearing. Listen it's really, them. really interesting, I tell you. Uh, when I come to speak with the uh, student Jewish organization, the Jewish community in the United States, I have met more than 3,000 people in one, two weeks. And I felt that I learned a lot of things from them. But one of the messages that I want them to take from my speeches, it's what that I started my speech to ask the students or the families that I speak with and ask them who loves the state of Israel. And everybody keep their hand up and say they love the state of Israel. So then I ask who know actually what happened now in the state of Israel? What no really happened? Else. Two or three people put their hand up. And I saw that different from the all the audience is loving Israel, but they're not knowing what really happened. And this is our big problem. So I tell to everyone that I ask two things for them. First of all, to know what really happened here in Israel. You need to know from the official news in the state of Israel, not from the media, Instagram, TikTok, there are a lot of fake news there. And the second thing, you need to come to the state of Israel even for one day to volunteer, to be with us. You are my sister and brother, our sister and brother. You need to feel this is your homeland. It's not a state of Israel, it's far away from you. We all Jewish. And it's right that I am Jewish and I'm living in the state of Israel. There's, there is Jews that live in USA, in Europe, in a lot of places around the world, but we are the same people yes. and we are the same destiny and we i really want to ask you shirley you're talking about around 10 million people which is a huge number you cannot deny what can really governments and societies do more to you know to support individuals with disabilities being deaf what can we do more to really support it especially in conflict zones Uh, first of all, we need to make sure that the Hasbara will be accessed. I take this mission in volunteering, a big love for the state of Israel to, to do it and make it access with an uh, international sun language. But the government need to give a budget for that to explain the need of the state of Israel every year, not just when there is a war and there is a person that wants to do it in volunteering uh, his free time. The second thing, the Jewish people who is deaf in Europe, in the United States, around the world, they don't have a school for Jewish and deaf. We definitely should, and I think it all starts with education. And what you're doing, Shirley, is extremely important. Keep up the amazing work, and good luck with your next trip. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected tonight alongside cool temperatures at lows of 12 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, more partly cloudy skies and temperatures that are set to slightly climb throughout the weekend, reaching highs of 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our LTV channel, subscribe to our LTV newsletter, and do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all of the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. Abamita Rari, be well, have a great weekend, and thank you so much for watching.